Hey YouTubers, it's Tom Anderson again. Uh, so my previous video got taken down because it apparently violated some sort of community guideline against promoting some sort of a dangerous activity. Uh, I'm not really sure what kind of dangerous activity that was because they didn't tell me. Um, the video was about how to use nutrition and vitamins to uh, promote immunity and to bolster your immune system so that you can fight things like the coronavirus. This wasn't a uh, personal opinion. This was, uh, I actually cited 16 different resources in my video description. And uh, this was a con continuation of my previous video in which I had 30 other citations. So very, very well cited, uh, meticulously researched. So what I did is uh, I removed even more of my personal opinion and made it really strictly about science as much as I could make it. Um, I highlight the actual papers I'm talking about I read quotations from the papers. These are scientists that are that are um, these, these words are coming from, and so uh, you know, I think it's really important information that everyone should know. And so I'm going to try again. I'm going to cut it cut it down and uh, put it out for you again, and, make, and see if we can get it past these uh, YouTube censors who apparently think that learning about nutrition is dangerous. So just as a in, in way of disclaimer, uh, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't play one on TV. Um, I'm a software engineer. I'm an emergency medical technician, and I'm a biohacker. I've read thousands and thousands of research papers. Uh, I know a lot about biology and medicine, um, but I'm not licensed to give any sort of uh, individual medical advice, so don't take this video as personal medical advice. This is for informational purposes, and so you have to make decisions for yourself that affect your own health. Um, I'm not promoting anything in particular except for getting information out there. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and represent um, some of the same material as I did from the last video. Hi, I'm Tom Anderson with the Anderson Alternative Channel. I'm here to talk to you about coronavirus again. This is my third video. Um, I'm still working on the video I promised, which is about the most potent and reliable, scientifically backed, natural antiviral known to man. But before I get to that, I wanted to quickly address some of the criticism I received um, about my last video, which if you haven't watched it yet, go check that out. Um, I definitely recommend that. But some people said something along the lines of, you can't bite them in your way to immunity. And the people who say this, um, they seriously believe that taking vitamins is some kind of like woo-woo recommendation. Um, as if it's the equivalent of like homeopathy or something like that. Um, and it's really just a sad testament to how far basic biological education has fallen uh, in this country and elsewhere. Um, or I guess maybe perhaps I should say how corrosively and comprehensively pharmaceutical misinformation has just permeated our society. Um, but back to the question of whether you can vitamin your way to immunity, which was exactly the case I made in my last video. Well, let's examine the clinical report that was published on Friday in the New England Journal of Medicine by the Washington State 2019 Novel Coronavirus Case Investigation Team regarding the first documented patient of coronavirus in the United States. He was a 35-year-old man recently returned from Wuhan, China, who after four days of cough and fever decided to visit an urgent care clinic in Snohomish County, Washington. This is the first time that we have really detailed documentation of the clinical features and progression of the disease. So we can analyze the signs and symptoms to see what was going on. At the urgent care clinic, after testing negative for influenza A and B, parainfluenza, respiratory syncytial virus, rhinovirus, adenovirus, and four common coronavirus strains known to infect humans, uh, they referred him to the Washington Department of Health and the CDC who tested him for 2019 novel coronavirus by a real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction assay. When the test came back positive, the patient was admitted to an airborne isolation unit at Providence Regional Medical Center for clinical observation. Although the patient reported a two-day history of nausea and vomiting, along with a persistent dry cough, and subjectively thought he had a fever, vital signs when he arrived at the hospital were actually within normal ranges and, uh, phys and physical examination was unremarkable. His temperature was only very slightly elevated at 98.96 degrees Fahrenheit, which is still within normal variation. So they put him on a saline drip and nausea medications. 
Now, uh, establishing an intravenous line with a saline drip uh, to keep it open is, of course, standard operating procedure for all admitted patients because hospitals are basically just vehicles for administering pharmaceuticals. And that's best accomplished in bulk by an IV catheter. So you have to realize that when you go in there, that that's going to be the primary standard of care, uh, if you can call it that. So initially the doctor said that they couldn't get complete blood counts and serum chemical studies due to the nature of the patient isolation unit, but starting on day three of hospitalization, they began receiving lab results. These numbers reflected leukopenia, which is a low white blood cell count, thrombocytopenia, which is a low platelet count, elevated creatine kinase, which is a sign of muscle damage, elevated liver enzymes, which is a sign of liver damage, um, elevated fibrinogen, which is a sign of tissue damage, elevated lactate dehydrogenase, which is another sign of tissue damage. Coronavirus was detected in the patient's nasopharynx, which is the back of the nose, uh, oropharynx, which is the back of the throat, and stool, but not in his blood. The patient's vital signs remained relatively stable, aside from a persistent non-productive cough, intermittent mild fevers with tachycardia, which is elevated heart rate, uh, diarrhea, fatigue, and nausea. Now, the clinical report doesn't try to explain these signs as being the result of any particular etiology or root cause, but what stands out to me is that, other than the cough, which was there from the beginning, um, these are all signs and symptoms of sepsis, which is blood poisoning. Sepsis is caused by the byproducts of the innate immune response that I talked about in my last video. When the neutrophils and macrophages engulf viruses, they destroy the pathogens with a respiratory burst that produces superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine bleach, and a few other prooxidants and byproducts. So this destroys the viruses, but if your body doesn't have enough antioxidants to neutralize these reactive molecules, then your blood literally becomes toxic. The oxidants start breaking down cells throughout your entire body. So the, the doctors in China uh, have identified this, um, and they saw sepsis as a major contribution to the morbidity and mortality of their first patients. In the descriptive study that they published in The Lancet on January 30th, they identified that patient number one developed severe respiratory failure, heart failure, and sepsis, and ultimately experienced a sudden cardiac arrest, which is a common mode of organ failure in septic patients. Patient two died of severe pneumonia, septic shock, and respiratory failure. So clearly these cases in China and the US are presenting very similarly. It's just that the US doctors didn't recognize that the patient had sepsis. Um, now that's my opinion. I'm not a doctor, um, but I can still analyze um, all the signs and symptoms and see that clearly these things align with what you would expect in sepsis. Certainly if the Chinese patients experienced that and the American patient experienced that, it certainly seems to be the same situation. So I don't know why the American doctors wouldn't have, have seen that and tried to treat the sepsis, but it doesn't look like that they, that they did that. So studies have shown that low antioxidant levels, um, in particular glutathione, are correlated to septic liver dysfunction. And as we said, this American, first American patient did have the liver enzymes that indicated he was having a liver dysfunction. And these studies have also shown that neutrophil-generated reactive oxygen species are the main reason why. Increasing evidence suggests that oxidative stress is the cornerstone of sepsis pathogenesis, especially superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl radicals that are produced by the uh, neutrophil's respiratory burst. The main uh, antioxidant enzymes to ameliorate the oxidatively induced sepsis are glutathione peroxidase, which catalyzes the conversion of hydrogen peroxide into water, superoxide dismutase, which converts superoxide into molecular oxygen and also into the less reactive hydrogen peroxide, and catalase, which catalyzes the breakdown of, of uh, hydrogen peroxide. There are also the low molecular weight substances like ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, glutathione, and alpha tocopherol, which is vitamin E. Again, I discussed all these in my last video. These serve to dampen the dysregulation of the innate immune cells. So this is all in, in the literature, this is all in the science. In multiple studies, greater antioxidant capacity was correlated to greater survival, while antioxidant deficiency was correlated with mortality. 
the relationship between antioxidant status and the sepsis outcomes sets the rationale for the use of antioxidant substances for the treatment of sepsis. These include, among other things, selenium to support the production of glutathione peroxidase. Not only is selenium administration associated with reduced incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia, but selenium sufficiency prior to illness correlates to fewer infections to begin with and decreased disease severity. And in a phase one safety trial of intravenous vitamin C in patients with severe sepsis, infusion was safe and well tolerated. Hospital mortality was 8.5% in the treatment group compared to 40.4% in the control group that didn't receive the vitamin C. So clearly the intravenous vitamin C made a huge difference in, in these patients with sepsis. And you don't need intravenous vitamins to affect the physiological levels either. In a study of female soccer players, one group ate a high antioxidant diet, including vitamins A, C, and E, versus a control group that didn't. After eight days of this diet, and following intense exercise, which generated systemic oxidative stress, the high antioxidant diet group had significantly higher levels of total antioxidant status, higher levels of superoxide dismutase, and glutathione peroxidase, and significantly lower levels of creatine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase, which again, in our first American coronavirus patient, we saw that creatine kinase and the lactate dehydrogenase were both elevated. So these girl soccer players that were taking this high antioxidant diet had lower levels of these two, these two enzymes that indicated muscle and tissue damage. So you know, even though we're talking about exercise-induced reactive oxygen species in this case with this study, um, it's still the same function as what happens with the immune system-induced reactive oxygen species. So clearly taking antioxidants in your diet can increase the levels in your system in a way that's physiologically active. So what did the doctors do for the Washington State coronavirus patient? We don't know what they fed him in the hospital. Uh, I would hope that it contained at least the USDA recommended amounts of these antioxidant uh, vitamins and minerals, hopefully more. But uh, many of their actions actually bordered on what I would consider to be medical negligence. Um, in my non-legal, non-medical opinion, um, but if, if I was the patient or the patient's family and the patient died, uh, I'd have been ready with a lawsuit because what they did is first they gave him antipyretic medications, uh, acetaminophen and ibuprofen, every six hours, despite the fact that fever helps to kill viruses and to stimulate the immune response. So unless he was having febrile seizures, there's really no reason to give him anti antipyretics because that's actually his, his immune system working properly. Next, they gave him antibiotics. Even though they knew this was a viral infection, they gave him antibiotics, vancomycin and cefepime, even though you know these would have no effect on the virus. I think maybe they, they might have thought that he could have had some sort of co-infection. Um, he was getting pneumonia at this point in time, but pneumonia is the main effect of the coronavirus. So why would they expect that to be a bacterial infection when that's the actual effect of this virus? So what is pneumonia? Pneumonia is an acute inflammatory response deep in the lungs in the alveoli. When a tissue is infected or injured, there's an inflammatory response in the simplest sense, an accumulation of pus. So what is pus? Pus contains blood elements, white blood cells, particularly the group of cells called neutrophils. As you'll recall, neutrophils are the primary innate immune system cell. These cells and proteins are essential to killing the microbes and overcoming the infection. Therefore, when we have pneumonia, we have to get these cells and proteins to where the, to where the microbes are in the lungs or we may succumb to the infection. However, the same pus is dangerous. Neutrophils make toxic and degradative products that are useful in killing microbes, but they can also damage the lungs. These toxic and degradative pro products are the reactive oxygen species from the respiratory burst. An example is hypochlorite, the active chemical in bleach, which is synthesized by the neutrophils in the pneumonic lungs. Good for killing bacteria and viruses uh, as well, um, but not so great for the lung cells. Yeah, and this can result in a pulmonary edema, which is the, the filling of the lungs with fluid, which makes it hard to breathe, and therefore you have to get supplemental air uh, through like a nasal cannula. So that's what pneumonia is and uh, both why it's um, good at killing the infection and why it's dangerous and can kill the host. Uh, they did cease the antibiotics after one day 
after testing for certain bacterial strains and coming up negative. But this short, strong dose of antibiotics probably caused immeasurable harm because it destroyed the patient's probiotic gut bacteria, which are integral to his immune system, and then also potentially bred antibiotic resistant strains because they didn't continue with it. So they gave him one short dose, which probably knocked out his probiotics and then potentially still has antibiotic resistant strains in him now. And then after the patient's status seemingly worsened, they uh, gave him antiviral treatments that were not indicated for this virus, but were experimental um, as sort of like a last resort. They give the patient the antivirals on the evening of hospital day seven. On day eight, the patient's status improved. And so the pharmaceutical establishment must have been congratulating itself at that point, right? They gave him the uh, antiviral medication on the seventh day. He's improving on the eighth day. Clearly, you know, that's a causal relationship, right? But if you look at the patient's neutrophil count, lymphocyte count, platelet count, it looks like he was already improving his immune response on day seven anyway, before taking the antiviral, probably in response to whatever nutrition they were giving him. And they were giving him supplemental oxygen through nasal cannulas. And plus just the time that was needed for his adaptive immune system to kick in. This was again on day eight of hospitalization, uh, day, I think it was 11 or 12 of his illness. So you know, his innate immune response was insufficient, it failed. And so by the time they gave him the antivirals, that should have been enough time for his adaptive immune system to have recognized the virus and developed the antibodies and the defenses to, to knock it out. It's possible that, the, that the, this antiviral had some sort of an effect on the virus by some miraculous chance that, you know, it's just this antiviral they happen to have in stock. But I mean, most likely the timing of the antiviral and the timing of the recovery was just pure coincidence. And as evidence of that, uh, he actually still tested positive in his nasopharynx on day 12. And you would think that an effective antiviral solution should have knocked out all the virus everywhere, right? Whereas an effective immune response may have preferentially focused on eradicating it from the most vital areas first and leaving it uh, in places that aren't going to be as um, infectious for him. But anyway, the real lesson here should be that this patient should never have developed sepsis and pneumonia in the first place, if his antioxidant levels were sufficient to keep his neutrophils working. Instead, he ran out of antioxidants, which led to insufficient defense against the virus and septic organ damage. An effective prevention would have been prophylactic vitamin consumption before exposure, and an effective treatment on day one should have been high-dose glutathione and vitamin C, either orally or intravenously. For more detail on how antioxidant vitamins and minerals both protect and enable your innate immune system, check out my prior video. Um, and if you find my content useful and want to be notified when I put out my next video, which will be about a potent, natural, scientifically studied antiviral that you can grow in your own backyard, then please like and share this video, subscribe to my channel, and click the bell icon to receive notifications. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.